I would encourage you to open your copy of God's Word this morning to Psalm 119. We read our passage earlier this morning. We are going through our sermon series through this chapter, Psalm 119. It's all about delighting in God's Word. That's the theme of the chapter. It's the goal of our sermon series, right, is that we would be delighting more and more in God's Word. And if you picked a, probably the most well-known across the board, believers and unbelievers, book of the Bible, Psalms might be one of them, right? If you ask anybody on the street, can you name a book of the Bible? Probably the Psalms might be one of their their first go-to answers. And if there is ever a chapter that people could identify out of the book of Psalms, it would be Psalm 119. It's the longest chapter, right? That's the one all about God's word. And if there is a verse within this chapter that people can think of from Psalm 119. If you just ask them without opening your Bible, what's one of the verses in Psalm 119? Our verse today in Psalm 119 verse 105 might just be the verse that they choose out of Psalm 119. It says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It's one of those verses that we've probably, if we grew up in church at least, we've heard that quite a few times, right? It's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And it's easy for us to, to, I think, read that verse and say, oh yeah, that's great, you know, it's like a flashlight, it's like a lamp, it shows us where we're going, blah, 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 get on with our lives. But what I want us to see this morning, what I think God would have us through his word to see is that this truth in Psalm 119 verse 105 this idea of God's word being a lamp to our feet and a light to our path is not just some transcendent truth that we need to contemplate this morning right but rather this is a reality that needs to be lived and so to show you the stark contrast between walking in complete darkness and walking in light or walking with a light, um, we have asked Andy to volunteer this morning. Did they already go back? They're already back. Okay, he's getting blindfolded right now. Yeah, go ahead and blindfold him. Make sure you can't hear what I'm saying. And uh, we're going to have Andy this morning demonstrate for us what it looks like to walk in darkness. Okay, and so I'm going to, in a moment, invite anybody who wants to, to come up and get one of these balls. And the only rule is don't grab a tennis ball. I didn't have time to sort them. We cannot break anything in here, so only grab the squishy balls. Okay, these are going to represent the different things that come at us as we walk through life. Okay, and so what we're going to do is I'm going to take two chairs if I could actually get help with this we're going to take two chairs and just block the back of that aisle nobody needs to sit in them Uh, it just needs to deter him from coming straight up and we're going to instruct him to start in the back doorway and try to find his way in the darkness all the way to the pulpit Uh, so he has to navigate the twists and turns that life gives to him he has to navigate the different attacks that come his way without being able to see while he's walking in the darkness. So if you want to participate in the throwing of squishy balls, you may come now and get a handful. As many as you want, just make sure they're squishy. No tennis balls. Adults are welcomed as well. This is your chance to get him back for all of the bad jokes that he tells. Okay, you guys can station yourselves wherever you want to. All right, Justin, if you could go grab Andy, have his wife direct him to the doorway. I'll give him just a couple instructions.
Apparently he can't walk very fast like this. <laughs> Come on, all the way into the doorway. You can lead him all the way to the doorway. Sorry, for, for those of you who are watching this, maybe online after the fact, you don't get to experience the greatness of this illustration. All right, stop right there. Can you see anything? Are you in complete darkness? Yes. Okay, awesome. So, as I described to you before the service, it is now your task to walk in darkness, navigate your way to the pulpit. Ready, go. Protect the camera back there. <laughs> Protect the camera. Can we take more out of here? Can we take more out of here? Mm -mm. Those are all tennis balls. I will give you a hint by talking so that you know where the pulpit is. My son has any heart in this. You will never know because you're blindfolded. This way. Stop. Try not to knock that over. Oh, it's a keyboard. All right. There you go. Enough. And he made it. All right, Andy, go ahead and take your blindfold off. All of the kids, go ahead and restock real quick. I'm sorry if I hit anyone. Now we're going to, no, hold on to those. You need them still. Because now we need to see what it's like to walk in the light. To walk with light. Being able to see. Having your eyes open. And I'll even give you the shield of faith to take with you. I'd like the sword too. And, yeah, you, you should take the sword as well. I, I thought about bringing a pool noodle for you, but. Um, so. Now you just have to walk. You can go any, any way you want. Just back through the door, that's all. all right. so, I'm going to go that way, guys. Ready, go. go. <laughs> all right. All right, thank you very much, Andy. Uh, if you want to chuck all the balls up to the front so they're not distracting you the whole service, that's fine. We'll pick them up. If you guys want to help me pick those up, that'd be great. So while they're picking those up, I want us to think just a little bit. I'd like for you to shout out. I'm going to try to write down. First of all, when Andy was blindfolded, right? When he was literally walking in darkness trying to navigate, what are some adjectives that described him? while he was walking in darkness. Cautious. Aimless. Slow. Cautious, slow, aimless, confused, confused. stumbling, stumbling. attacked. Attacked. <laughs> that is true. Clueless. What's that? Clueless. Defenseless. Even afraid. Defenseless. I'm not going to be able to read what I'm even writing down here, but uh, this is great. Any, any others? That's good. How about once, once he had light and still was getting attacked, wh what are some adjectives that you might use to describe him as he was going back out now that he could see? Athletic. Okay. <laughs> Athletic. <laughs> Athletic. Not sure I'm going to swing that into a spiritual application, but... We'll, we'll go with it. 
Uh, I heard one other. Confident, Confident. excellent. Alert. Confident, alert, what else? Defensive. Defensive. On guard, what else? I heard a few more in here. Protection. Protected. Strategic. Purposeful, awesome, yeah. So as, as you think about these two different categories, the two different descriptions that we have put together of walking in darkness versus walking with, with light to, to show you the way, you can see really how practical and how drastic of a difference it becomes, right? When, when you're walking in the darkness, you, by necessity, if you're smart at all, will be perhaps even overly cautious, slow, aimless, confused, stumbling, clueless, defenseless, and afraid, constantly guessing what's next without ability to detect the things that might be coming your way or to see the curves in the road that might come next. I think we're taking it a step further. There's a lot of fear in darkness. If you've ever been walking somewhere, you've never walked before and it's complete darkness, there's fear there. There's perhaps loneliness and hopelessness. But notice the change once you introduce light into the darkness. Now we use adjectives like athletic, <laughs> confident, alert, Defensive, on guard, protected, strategic, aware, purposeful. That's what God's word does for us. It literally changes everything. It gives us understanding. It reveals reality. It guides and directs. It gives freedom. It provides confidence and comfort and protection from pitfalls. In the same way, God's word as our light radically changes our lives. And that's what the psalmist really goes on to speak about throughout, really not only this section of Psalm 119, but lots of the other sections as well. He speaks about just how God's word changes the different things that he encounters during his life. And so that's what we want to look at through these short, this short little passage this morning is how the light of God's word impacts our everyday life. Or perhaps how it should, if we would just let it. The first thing that we see in verse 106 is that the light of God's word motivates us to obey. The light of God's word motivates us to obey. Because he knows that God's word is a lamp, it is a light. He then in verse 106 says, I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. In many ways, it's ironic. When we, when we struggle to obey the word of God, it's probably because we have not been in the word of God. The more we consume it, the more we meditate on it, the more we memorize it and hide the word in our hearts, the more we'll be motivated to obey it. He says, I have sworn it and then confirmed it that I will keep your righteous rules. How many of you have been there before? Something, something crazy happens in your life and, and you commit. I'm, I'm reading God's word every single day. The rest of my life, I'm not going to miss a day. And then three days later, maybe three weeks later, maybe three months later, you miss a day. And then you miss another day. And, you know, if you're like me, as you've been reading through Psalm 119, there, there have been things that he says throughout this psalm where it's like, that is so unattainable. Like, how can you say you never depart from God's word? How can you say that you've never gone astray from God's word? How can you say that you've sworn this oath and confirmed it and kept all the righteous rules? And I think we would do well in, in these verses to remember that this is the Psalms. It's poetry. It's songs that people would then eventually sing. 
right? And so when, when you write poetry or when you write songs, oftentimes we'll use phrases like that to demonstrate a truth, but also something that we're striving after, right? So the psalmist is not just flippantly saying, I've sworn an oath. He's, he's really serious about his commitment to God's word. But at the very same time, we have to remember what type of writing this is. We do this all the time, even in our own lives, as we worship the Lord, as we sing songs to him. We'll sing songs like, I surrender all. Oh, well, do you really? We sing songs like, Lord, I need you. Lord, I come, I confess, bow in here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. We sing songs like, my hope is built on nothing less. Than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. As he writes that he will keep the law, just like he does that, today we sing songs that remind us of what is true, right, and good. In one sense, they're commitments and dedications to the Lord and our worship towards him. But in another sense, they're also our desire, our prayer that we would ever increasingly grow into them. Just this morning, we sang, I will stand upon your truth. All my days I'll live for you. I won't worry about tomorrow. I'm giving you my fears and sorrows. Where you lead me, I will follow. I am trusting in what you say. And so although the, the, the poetry aspect of this text is certainly there. He still is very serious about his oath. The New Testament would guard us to be cautious about making a promise or swearing to an oath that we do not intend to keep. And so it's not downplaying the commitment to God's word, but it's recognizing that the psalmist here in Psalm 119 has seen the word's beauty. He's experienced its guidance He's tasted its goodness, he's treasured its power, he's learned its sufficiency, and he respects its authority. He has found delight in the light of the word, and therefore he's motivated to obey the word. You see, whether we acknowledge it or not, the word is our greatest authority, and it is our best guide. You can live in denial of that, you can live contrary to that all you want and in fact many men choose to live in the darkness and they get pretty comfortable there but the psalmist would invite us to join him in engaging with the light and understanding that it must shine upon every corner of our lives the light of god's word motivates us to obey the second thing that the light of God's word does is it guides us in our suffering. Verse 107 says, I am severely afflicted, so give me life, O Lord, according to your word. It guides us in our suffering. You guys, if you've been here for the last several weeks listening to our series throughout Psalm 119, you know that suffering and hardship and affliction and persecution are a theme that runs rampant throughout Psalm 119. Those are no stranger to the psalmist here in Psalm 119. He's experienced it all. It's, it's coming at him from all sides, just like those squishy balls were coming at Andy from every single which direction. The psalmist was experiencing suffering. And I think that's the first lesson to take from, from this particular verse is that he says, I am severely afflicted. It's, it's not that we might suffer. It's not that we might be afflicted. It's not that we might have hard things happen to us. It's that you will face hardship. You will face suffering. You will face affliction, at least in this world that we currently live in. In some ways, you might actually suffer more if you commit yourself to the word of God. Jesus said, they hated me, they will surely hate you as well. And so we can think of the illustration we used this morning 
Even when Andy was walking back out, he could see he had his shield to protect him. That didn't mean that suddenly the attacks just vanished away and life was a skip in the park. No, he still had to be strategic. He still had to fight and shield himself and protect himself and be aware of what was surrounding him. But there's a freedom that will never be experienced apart from walking with the light of God's word through those things. You know, in, in some ways, the illustration falls short for us because it's not that every lamp doesn't completely illuminate an entire room or an entire forest, if you want to go that route, right? We have this, this idea that the word of God is a lamp unto our feet. A lamp doesn't illuminate everything in the distance, but it does illuminate what's most important, and that's the very next steps that you need to take in obedience to the word of God. And so I think oftentimes walking in or with the light of God's word, especially in the midst of affliction and hardship and suffering, looks like us simply taking that one next step that's in front of us. That might look like taking a step of patience towards that difficult individual in your life. It might look like taking a step and being willing to forgive someone even though it's hard. Stepping forward with love when all you're receiving is hate. Stepping forward with obedience even when temptation is so strong. Stepping forward in trust even though you can't see what's around that corner. But you can see what's right in front of us. The lamp to our feet allows us to continually take that next step. If you want a biblical perspective of hardship and suffering, I would encourage you to go and listen to our message from last week. We had Jonathan Mahalski with us, and I'm not going to rehash everything he went through, but here's a missionary serving in Uganda with his wife and kids, and uh, he didn't mention all the malaria that they've had and all the other hardships. He simply was focused on the most recent hardship of multiple back surgeries and multiple back surgeries that went wrong and had repercussions so that he could barely walk for extended periods of time, having chronic, ongoing, never-ending, not stopping pain that he had to deal with. And as he was able to share with us very, very transparently some of the stuff that, that he was walking through, at the same time, I, I couldn't help but to think, man, you're not really even mentioning, like, he's mentioning the, like the hurdles that they had to jump through, but it was almost like a, a downplay of just how difficult something like that really is. And I don't think he was necessarily downplaying the difficult realities of life, but what, where God had taken to was a place that would say, those difficulties are worth it for what God has produced out of this suffering. It was worth the suffering. It was worth the hardship, and it continues to be so. He's not out of it. He's still in the midst of it. And so it's, it's with that perspective. I am severely afflicted, but give me life according to your word. It's with that perspective that he could quote to us verses that Paul said, like 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace really is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness, therefore I boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That's why he could quote verses to us like James 1, 2, Count it all joy, brothers, when you meet various trials of various kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let it have its full effect that you might be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Sounds similar to 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God. It's proper for teaching, for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness. The man of God may be perfect, thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's often that in the midst of our affliction, God will bring us to a point where we can actually experience the spiritual life that he has intended for us. Jesus promised life, not only just life, he promised abundant life. 
But so often what we have to realize is that abundant life is not found in the things of the world. It's found in God himself and a relationship with him. And so the light motivates us to obey. It guides us in our suffering. And then in verse 108, we see that the light of God's word impacts our worship. Verse 108, accept my free will offerings of praise, O Lord, and teach me your righteous rules. The light of God's word impacts our worship. The illumined path and the life-giving power of God's word drives the psalmist to worship. We see here in verse 108 that he's offering praise to the Lord. Right? He's, he's worshiping, maybe in song, maybe in prayer. It doesn't really tell us how he's worshiping, but in one way or another, he is offering praise up to the Lord. And there's a few things that we learn about worship here in verse 108. The first thing is that worship is of our own free will. Look at that. He says, accept my free will offering. What does it mean that he's giving a free will offering? It means that he's offering it without expecting anything in return. Right? God's acceptance of our worship depends not upon our holiness, but the holiness of the one that we're giving it to. We do not worship to get something, but rather we worship because we've already received something. Right? Worship is the right response to who God really is. And so our worship is just a free will. And so he's saying, Lord, take this. this. This is what I have to give to you. This is my praise. A search through scripture would have us find that the most meaningful times of worship were when individuals and peoples were in awe of their great God. It is the response to him rather than an attempt to manipulate him that brings the greatest joy. How often does our worship, not just what we do on Sunday, I'm talking about our daily living, our worship on a daily basis. How often is that motivated from an attempt to manipulate God, an attempt to say, I'm doing this and this and this, so I deserve this and this and this. When in reality, our worship is simply just the response of recognizing, Lord, everything I have already is because of your grace. I deserve nothing apart from you and what you've done in my life. That's true free will worship. Worship will also be marked by increased desire for instruction. He says, teach me your rules. This is something that we see the psalmist coming back and back to again. He, he's never arrived He always wants to know more and learn more and understand more. And that's true of our worship as well, right? The more that we know God's word, the more it will drive us towards worship. And the more that we worship, the more it's going to drive us to God's word. To have that humility to say, no matter where I'm at in my spiritual progress or lack of progress, keep me hungry for more. Continue to teach me your word. You know, God's word is a daily opportunity for us to know God more, to grasp his greatness, to marvel at his majesty, to savor his sovereignty, to find joy in his justice, to be grateful of his graciousness, to even be flabbergasted by his faithfulness, to be humbled by his holiness, to be smitten by his sacrifice, to be wowed by his wisdom, to be moved by his mercy, to be grateful for his goodness, and to perceive his unmatched power. This is why we read God's word. I was talking to somebody this week about trying to understand God's word and and how to be reading it. And we got into a discussion about how so often we, we read God's word to discover ourselves. And I think that's a wrong way to read God's word. We read God's word to discover him. It's all about him. And once we know him and once we have that light and that lamp, that is what guides us. We don't need to look within ourselves. We need to look up to a God 
who is the creator of the universe. These are the truths that will light our path and help us to continue walking in worship. May we not lose sight of the greatness of God. The light of the word motivates us to obey. It guides us in our suffering. It impacts our worship. And then in verses 109 and 110, we see that the light of God's word gives perspective during danger. That's, I think, maybe even one of the words that was listed when we were describing Andy on his way out this morning, trying to dodge. He, he had perspective, right? He could see and understand what was going around with him. Not perfectly, mind you. We can never see everything. So often we want, we want the whole thing, right? We want God, tell me what's going to be happening 10 years from now, or maybe just tomorrow, please. And, and God says to us, no, I've, I've given you enough for that next step. You have a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. But the light of God's word does give us perspective during danger. And there's kind of two different types of danger. One in verse 109 and one in verse 110. The first type of danger is in verse 109 where he says, I hold my life in my hand continually. Remember the psalmist here, perhaps David, most likely, I think, it was probably David. Spent a lot of his life running and hiding and trying to avoid danger and pitfalls. Right? We, we see that he's constantly running. Constantly begging just for his own life. And so he, he understands this truth of the brevity of life. Right? He understands the reality of its brevity. So, so he says, I hold my life continually in my hand. Right? This idea that my life could end today. So I'm making these plans, I'm plotting my path, but at the end of the day, my life is in the, in the palm of my hand. It, it, it could vanish like that. Right? James reminds us that our life is just a vapor. It's here for a moment and vanishes the next day. And so he holds loosely to the plans that he sets for his life. So where is the psalmist while well, he's continually running, continually dodging and avoiding the different attacks coming his way? Where does he go to find his safety? Well, Spurgeon said, while he carried his life in his hand, he also carried the law in his heart. And so he says, no danger of body should ever endanger our souls by forgetting that which is right. He says, I hold my hand in my life continually, but I do not forget your law. I will cling tightly to it. And so the first danger there is just this, this reality of the brevity of our life. The, the perhaps physical dangers that might come our way, the car crashes that might happen, the prognosis that we might receive. We never know what's going to happen Next, there's danger in that way, but also in verse 110, there's another danger, and that is the reality of Satan's attacks. The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. I love that word illustration. The wicked have laid a snare. They've set a trap for me. What's a snare? What, how does a trap work for an animal? Right? You give it something that it wants or thinks it's want, it wants. And, and that thing, whether it's food, whatever it is, that animal says, ooh, that looks good. That looks tasty. That looks enjoyable. Let me go indulge a little bit. And the second they wiggle that little piece of food, they're trapped. That's the same way with the snares that Satan lays for us, isn't it? He's constantly promising us things that those items could never give to us. He, he, he promises us so much, but in return, what we actually get is death. He says, come, indulge in this activity over here. Purchase this thing over here. Pursue this relationship in this way. Follow your heart in this way, even though your heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Compromise your beliefs in just this one little area. It'll be okay. But time and time again, those things that he offers us 
never provide what they promise. We can go back all the way to Genesis. This is how it began. Remember Adam and Eve in the garden? The serpent tempted them with that delicious looking fruit. But remember, they literally had all of the fruit they could ever want. I mean, they lived in a perfect garden, right? They had some luscious fruit. What made that fruit so appetizing for them? I don't actually think it was the fruit itself. Because there was, there had, it was perfect. All the fruit was perfect. And so what made it so that they wanted that fruit so bad? It's what Satan promised them that fruit would give them. He's laying the trap. He's setting a snare for us so that he can bring death into our lives. The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. That's why we need the word. That's why we need the light for our path and the lamp to our feet so that we can see with clarity those snares and traps that are set before us. I do not forget your law. You know, as we, as we think through all these things, there's, there's so many passages of Scripture that are applicable to each one of these, whether it's motivating us in obedience or guiding us in our suffering or whatever it is. In, in, this, in this case, guiding us through, through these different dangers or temptations or snares. Just a few i like to mention. Are, the first one is Hebrews 4.15 that would just remind us that no matter what we're going through, to remember that we have a great high priest who is not unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Right? He became a man. He understands what temptation is to its fullest. He was tempted in every way just as we are yet without sin. I think of 1 Corinthians 10.13 that will remind us that no temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to man. But God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. I think of 1 John 4.4, 4, the reality of greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. I think of Romans 6.14 that says, Sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. I think of Romans 8, 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. What about when we do fail? What about when we do slip up, when we do take the bait? 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Whether in our danger, in our time here on earth, whether it's our literal lives are in danger because life is short, whether it's the devil's attacks, the light of God's word is shining brightly to guide us. It's there to comfort us. It's there to secure us. It's there to quicken us and give us life and give us confidence. But what if we don't have the word? Then we're stumbling. Then we're unaware. We, we can't even see correctly to perceive what is laying in front of us. We're trying to delight in God's word. So whether you're struggling to obey and live for God, experiencing affliction or hardship, struggling to worship maybe, living in danger, unknown future, attacks from the wicked, struggling with temptation, where do we go? What do we need? Who is our foundation? Where is our refuge? What is our stronghold? A little sneak peek into next week, verse 114. You, God are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. And that brings us to the last two verses of our text this morning, verses 111 and 112, 
that would show us the light of God's word becomes the joy of our hearts. Let's read those. It says, Your testimonies are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart, so I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. He says, my heritage. You got me thinking a little bit. What, what do we think of as, what is my heritage? Okay, if, if you're proud of your heritage, can I see a hand? So we got some proud Scandinavians or du- any, any Dutch in the house? Yeah? If you ain't Dutch, you ain't much. Yeah. Preach. Um, yeah, right? So, some of us can get so proud of, of, of where we come from. Maybe some of you aren't proud. Maybe you're embarrassed of, of your heritage. I, I was thinking about that. And, and our heritage is often something that was given to us. So it was often, in, in a lot of scenarios, it's a good thing. It's, it's traditions, it's, it's these things to, to look back and, and they, it's like a sense of this is, this is where I came from, right? This is where I belong. This is part of what makes me who I am. That's my heritage. And the psalmist here is saying the word of God is my heritage. This is what makes me who I am. This is what I'm most proud of. This is the joy of my heart. Notice this emphasis on the heart. He says, it's the joy of my heart. And then because of that, he then responds, responds and said, I then incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. One author said his whole heart was bent on practical, persevering godliness. He had by prayer and meditation and resolution made his whole being lean towards God's commands. That's what we're getting after here. Let's lean towards God and his word. Proverbs 4, 18 through 22 says this. The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn which shines brighter and brighter until full day. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them with your whole heart. For they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Do you believe that this morning? Do you believe that God's word is life-giving? Is it really acting like the light to your path and the lamp to your feet? I wonder, how would our lives change if we were suddenly depraved of our ability to have access to God's word? If suddenly our access to his word was completely restricted, would our lives even change? Or how about the alternative? What if somehow we could force each other all to spend at least 15 minutes each day studying, meditating, and memorizing God's holy word? How much would that change our lives? I would encourage you to think and maybe even write down in your notes this morning, what is one practical way that I can pursue delighting in God's word more this week than I did last week? It doesn't mean you, you have to reach perfection this week. All, all we want is a little bit better than the week before. Realize that we can't do it in our own strength. It's all God and his grace and his spirit working through us. But but let's ask him to do that. Let's ask him to help us to delight in God's word. And then next week when we have our little mini sermon, I'd like to have a portion of that sermon be a testimony time, an opportunity for you guys to share with the rest of our church family here how has God been using his word in your life over the last several weeks. And so I would encourage you guys to, to be thinking about that and, and praying about that and coming prepared next week uh, to share how God's word has been impacting you lately.
Let's pray. God, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you that your word is living, it's active, and it's powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing and dividing joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intents of our hearts. Your word is what we need. It directs us to you, our source of life. And so we pray, Lord, I don't, I don't know where everybody's at this morning. I don't know what hardship or what temptation or what type of darkness they might be walking through right now. But I pray that you would help us this week to run to your word, the one true light to our path and lamp for our feet. God, thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.